Hello, everybody, and welcome to this um, talk with um, housing barrister Robert Brown, uh, where we're going to be discussing the Supreme Court decision um, in the case of Rakusin and Jepson. So uh, good morning, Robert. Morning, Tessa. Thank you for setting this up. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, Tessa says I'm a housing barrister. I'm based at Selborne Chambers in London. And um, one of the reasons I want to talk to you about Rakusin and Jepson uh, is a case that I was involved in. I was um, fortunate enough to be asked by the National Residential Landlords Association. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them and with Ben Beadle, who uh, does podcasts with Tessa, uh, to act for them in doing an intervention in the Supreme Court case, along with one of my colleagues from Chambers, Rosie Baker. And we thought it'd be helpful just to explain what it is that the Supreme Court actually decided and what it means. And um, to try and put that in the context of what rent repayments actually are and how they work. OK, so um, we've got some slides, so I'm going to bring the slides up in a minute. Um, you will be able to download them. I've put them in the handouts and you can also download them via the sticky message that I've put in the chat. Um, this is mostly going to be Robert's presentation and I will be talking to him a bit about the case. If you have any questions, put them in the chat and we may answer them, but we're not promising to answer all questions because this is mostly a, a presentation about the case. But if you've got any questions or thoughts about, about the case, feel, feel free to put them there. And uh, if we have time, I'll, um, I'll put them to Robert. Absolutely. So, Robert, let's put the slides up and yeah. um, switch ourselves. We showed ourselves at the beginning so you could see who we yeah, are. Yeah, we just wanted to say hello. <laughs> you put faces to names, but I think I'll turn it off now just to make sure everything works. So uh, thank you. That's, there we go. Good. So <clears throat> I want to talk about rent repayment orders, and I want to talk about this Supreme Court case, Rackerson and Jepson. Um, what I want to do is really give you... Um, First of all, a bit of background about rent repayment orders. I appreciate some of you may know fully what they are and how they work and how they're quantified. For others, it might be something a bit new. And I think you can only really understand the Supreme Court's decision and the effects of it if you have some sense of that background, that framework. But I don't want to uh, spend all the time on that. So we will uh, go through that relatively quickly if we can. And I want to just um, explain what this case was actually about just in terms of the facts because that gives it some grounding that makes this actually quite technical aspect of the law it brings it to life a little bit i think and we're going to talk about what it was that the supreme court actually decided and the end I'm just going to spend a little while talking about implications and possible future developments um, that may flow from this and may flow from any uh, potential legislation that might come in particular and i'm sure you'll have heard about this a lot but the renters reform bill that is uh, on the horizon so the the actual case in rackerson and jepson was uh, a situation where there are multiple landlords property is owned by x x grants a head tenancy to y y then sublets to various occupational tenants z1 z2 z3 z4 and the question was, when Z1, Z2 and Z3 bring an application for a rent repayment order against the landlord, can they only bring that against Y or can they bring it against X as well? And the reason this is important is that um, the applicants in that case and some of the other interveners were saying that there are, are problems that you have these sort of intermediary landlords that don't have any money that you can't enforce against them. That's what it's all about. But let's just try and put that in a bit more of a wider context. So rent repayment orders uh, were introduced as a sort of brand new idea by the Housing Act 2004. And as introduced, they were of relatively limited scope. They were revised and expanded in England um, and expanded quite significantly in terms of the uh, uh, situations when they can be made. And the procedure has changed a little bit by the Housing and Planning Act 2016. And that's what the legislation that the Supreme Court was looking at in Rackerson. The 2004 Act, those parts of the 2004 Act still apply in Wales. So if any of you are, are, um, have properties in Wales, some of what I'm talking about, the Supreme Court was, was looking at the new legislation, the English legislation. And I'll try and flag up the position in Wales as we go as well. The so rent repayment order is something that can be uh, made um, on an application to, in England, the first tier tribunal property chamber, 
in Wales there's a leasehold valuation tribunal as it used to be in England but that became or everything was transferred over to the first tier tribunal property chamber in England in 2013 and those tribunals um, can uh, make a rent repayment order on an application by a tenant or a local housing authority and it depends who's been paying the rent really um, tenants would make an application to get their rent back local housing authorities can do it in relation to rent that's been paid by universal credit or housing benefit and where rent repayment order is made by a tribunal that is enforceable as a debt so what that means is if the landlord doesn't pay it can be enforced using normal county court enforcement procedures which can include bailiffs being sent and things like that i'm not going to discuss that but there are processes for doing that and rules under the civil procedure rules so <clears throat> let's let's look then at what the 2016 act actually says and what you find in some modern legislation is um rather than the way the old legislation used to do it which is you would just have a series of sections that just set out the law each section did something it's quite common now to have sort of gentle introductory sections that tell you a bit about what the legislation is going to do rather than actually doing any of it and help you navigate your way around it and um Housing Planning Act 2016 certainly does that at the beginning when it's talking about rogue landlords and when it gets to rent repayment orders it has this very important uh, piece at section 40 telling you what a rent repayment order is and actually when we come to Rackus and Jepson some of the words here are the key words that the Supreme Court had to consider so Section 40 says there's a power on the first tier tribunal to make a rent repayment order where a landlord has committed an offence to which this chapter applies. And in a moment, I'll tell you what those offences are, the ones that that chapter of the Act applies to. Section 40, subsection 2, you'll see that on the third bullet point there, really the key words of the legislation so far as the Rackerson case was concerned, telling you what a rent repayment order is. And it's an order requiring the landlord under a tenancy of housing in England to repay an amount of rent paid by a tenant or uh, pay to a local housing authority an amount in respect of a relevant award of universal credit paid in respect of rent under the tenancy. And elsewhere in the legislation, universal credit is defined as including housing benefit where you have uh, um, occupiers who are still in receipt of housing benefit haven't actually moved over to the housing element of universal credit yet that part's slightly different from the housing act 2004 because as you may recall when that was brought into force there was no universal credit so it initially only referred to housing benefits and was subsequently changed later to make it housing benefit and or universal credit um, 2016 act it says universal credit but it then, as I say, defines that to incorporate housing benefit. I think Parliament was rather anticipating when this was passed in 2016 that housing benefit would be phased out perhaps a little quicker than has actually been the case, given problems with universal credit. But that subsection two, that's key. It's an order requiring the landlord under a tenancy of housing in England to repay an amount of rent or pay an amount in respect of universal credit. We'll come back to that when we look at the facts and the decision of the Supreme Court. So there's offences that it applies to. This is really, really important. Under the Housing Act 2004, it was limited to two offences, both of them offences under the 2004 Act, both relating to having or not having a licence where a licence was required. So you've got offences contrary to section 72 and 95, about control or management of an unlicensed HMO, House and Multiple Occupation, or an unlicensed Part 3 House where it's required to be licensed. That's still the position in Wales. And um, Tessa, I know, uh, recently done a, a podcast looking at changes in the law in Wales and uh, understand the sort of indications are that's going to remain the position in Wales for the foreseeable. Welsh housing law has gone off in very much its own direction, building on recommendations made by the Law Commission some years ago. The Renting Homes Wales Act finally being brought fully into force with effect from December last year. And it's going to be very different in many respects. But um, so I think uh, Tess and I were discussing this just before we started and the suggestion seems to be that rent repayment orders in Wales are going to remain as they are. 
no doubt the new legislation that's coming in needs some bedding in time before there are any more dramatic changes. Yes, that's what, just, um, I, was, that's what I was told um, by Simon White when uh, Ben and I interviewed him on the on the podcast. Um, okay. It doesn't necessarily yeah, so mean they, that they're not going to, but that, that was his view at the time, yeah. that they're not going to change it in the immediate future. Yeah, well, there you go. And I should suggest, I imagine, and if you do have properties in Wales, that's probably a, a good podcast to catch up on, which is something that's on my list to do as well. The, just just note, though, that these offences, <clears throat> the trigger offences under the 2004 Act for a Rent Repayment Order, which also apply still in England under the 2016 Act, they're not all the offences that there might be in relation, in relation to HMOs. So, for instance, it doesn't cover breach of the HMO management regulations. This, this is only aimed at failure to have a licence where there should be a licence. That, so that, that's an important point. Housing and Planning Act 2016, the really big change that it makes is it takes these two offences and adds, uh, depending on the way you count them, five or maybe even seven more. So first one, breach of criminal law Act 1977, uh, section six, which is the offence of using violence for securing entry. That's actually basically the foundation of what's called squatter's rights. That's a piece of legislation that it's in the 1977 Act. It dates back way, way before that, much older versions. Um, Similarly, Protection from Eviction Act 1977, offences under Section 21. Uh, this is why I say that the, it adds five or maybe seven offences. It depends on whether you count the offences under Section 1 of that Act as just one offence or three different offences. But it's basically things to do with eviction or harassment of occupiers, unlawful eviction or harassment of occupiers. Um, uh, a lot of that dates back to 1977 and even before. The current form that we find it in is in the 1977 Act, but that was reenacting earlier legislation, um, subsection 3A, which is a specific way of committing an offence that was added later on. Then you've got two more that are picked up from the Housing Act 2004, Section 30 and Section 32, failure to comply with an improvement notice or prohibition order. And those are things that local housing authorities can do when the condition of premises is not up to scratch, basically where there are hazards. And I'm sure you're familiar with the way in which local housing authorities go about identifying hazards in accommodation and the powers that they have. <clears throat> Again, these are criminal offences. Um, there can be criminal proceedings brought for them, but they also can be trigger offences for rent repayment orders. So it's an additional sanction. And the final one is actually an offence under Housing and Planning Act 2016, which is breach of a banning order. Banning orders were a big new device introduced in the 2016 Act, which is that on an application to a tribunal, that tribunal can make an order banning someone from being engaged in letting the property manager work for a period of time. The minimum length of an order, I think, is 12 months. Uh, that, that really has quite a substantial effect on your business if you're a landlord or a letting agent, because that's your business shut down for a period of time. It does seem not many banning orders have been made, but it is a remedy that's there and was supposed to be the one to be used to drive rogue landlords out of the market. Um, and obviously to make sure that has some teeth, the uh, legislation includes the fact that if a banning order is put in place and you breach it, that's a criminal offence. And further sanction added on to that was the possibility of a rent repayment order if you act in breach of a banning order. So those are the additional trigger offences that were added in 2016 in order to expand the scope of rent repayment orders and sort of reflect that Parliament thought that they were a useful weapon against rogue landlords because they said, right, here are some more situations where they can be used to really go at the bad guys. So it's how is an application to be made? Go on, sorry, I, Tessa. I was just saying it's interesting, though, that although there are all these other trigger offences for rent repayment order the general view seems to be that they are used for um failure to obtain hmo or selective licensing uh, and maybe it's because that's so easily proved you've either got the license or you haven't 
But I don't. I yeah, think I think that's... mentioned that because I don't think a lot of people are aware of the other triggers that are available. I, I think that's right, Tessa. I think that, I think that is right. We'll we'll come on in a moment just to mention some <clears throat> propositions of law that you get from a couple of other cases, and a couple of them do involve some of the other offences, which is interesting. But I, I would suspect, and I haven't looked at the stats for this, but I suspect the vast majority of applications are brought in respect of failure to obtain licenses simply because in most respects you would think that's pretty cut and dry whereas proving some of the other offences is a little more involved. Uh, one would also hope that some of the other offences aren't committed as frequently but that might be <laughs> that might be naive I don't know. So how are these applications made? Um, important thing is uh, and, and this bit here is, I mentioned that applications could be made by tenants or local housing authorities. Um, th this bit here about timing particularly relates to applications made by tenants. It's a bit different for local housing authorities. And I'll flag that up in a moment. But the application has to be made within 12 months of the offence having been committed, whatever that offence was. Now, if the offence is something like failure to have a licence, obviously that's a continuing offence up to the point that a license is obtained or the tenancy ends or whatever it might be. So it might be the sum of the period of time in the house, but as long as you can get some of it within 12 months, you're okay. Unlawful eviction, those sorts of things, you're obviously looking at the, the relevant date. It's a bit different for local housing authorities, as I mentioned. Your application, the application needs to identify the correct landlord, but, and this is the rackers in question, is that only the immediate landlord or any landlord? give the game away, we'll come to that in a moment, but that's a key question that Rackerson had to look at. If the application identifies the wrong landlord, which does happen, it is possible to amend it later to bring the right one in, but only if that amendment is done within the 12 month period. That's the case called Gurusingi and Drumlin that you see there, where the uh, tribunal, first year tribunal, upper tribunal, read the legislation and the tribunal rules to give it that effect and just if you are ever in the position of applying for a rent repayment order i'll put the link on the slides and tests put the slides she says on the handouts uh, tab there so you've got that <clears throat> the link to the form that you use rro the rent repayment order rro one that's the form to use now if you follow that it sets out all the things you need to do really now um We've talked about there being trigger offences, criminal offences, and those can be prosecuted in the criminal court. But it's not an absolute requirement that they are done uh, before a rent repayment order can be made. A tribunal can make a rent repayment order even if there hasn't been a conviction. Now, actually, if there has been a conviction, the process is obviously easier because it's easier to prove the offence. You turn up with a certificate of conviction, that just about does it. Also for tenants, there is some advantage if there's been a conviction because the amount of the rent repayment order is generally going to be higher. But tribunals can effectively um, hear the evidence and determine themselves that a criminal offence has been committed. Uh, if satisfied, beyond reasonable doubt that the landlord has committed relevant offence. It's interesting that Parliament used beyond reasonable doubt because although I don't do uh, criminal work, my understanding is that that's not the direction that's given to juries anymore. It's thought to be too much scope for uncertainty about what was a reasonable doubt and what was an unreasonable doubt. And juries now are generally told they just need, well not just, but that they need to be sure that an offence has been committed. Yet beyond reasonable doubt is used here. <clears throat> now, um, Para and Olaseimo is actually a case about unlawful eviction. The tenant brought an application saying they'd been unlawfully evicted by their landlord and they wanted a rent repayment order. And the first tier tribunal said that they had a doubt as to whether the landlord had committed the offence. So they didn't uh, make a rent repayment order. It was an appeal to the upper tribunal which reviewed the witness statements and the evidence and the first tier tribunal's findings of fact. Didn't hear any live evidence. Um, and said that the first year tribunal had gone wrong because the requirement to prove it beyond reasonable doubt doesn't mean beyond any doubt. You can have a doubt, just not a reasonable one. Um, that's where this language is perhaps slightly unhelpful. And the upper tribunal said 
from the evidence and the findings of the first year tribunal, any doubt that they had was not a reasonable one. The offence was proved and a rent repayment order should be made. So say this doesn't require a conviction, um, but if you're going to the tribunal without a conviction, you're going to need to prove the offence. This is the point that Tess is making, I think. The, the, the um, lack of a licence is a fairly easy thing to prove. Really, all you then get into is the defence of reasonable excuse. So um, you then have to work out if a rent repayment order is to be made, how is that amount of rent to be calculated? And there are three different ways, depending on whom the application is made by. If it's made by a tenant, you look at section 44. If it's made by a local housing authority, section 45. Unless in either case there's been a conviction, in which case you go to section 46. Basically, the, the, the difference is that if there's been a conviction, the, the amount of the rent repayment order is normally going to be just the maximum, whatever the rent paid was, or whatever the universal credit paid was. If there hasn't been a conviction, um, the tribunal has uh, much more discretion to make a lower award. So um, <clears throat> where you're looking at a tenant, tenant's application, the amount of a rent repayment order must relate to rent paid during the period of 12 months ending with the date of the offence. So you find out when the offence was committed or the last date that you're looking at if you're looking at something like failure to obtain a licence. You do the 12 months before. And the amount must not exceed the rent paid in respect of that period. So you're looking at the, um, the, the, rent, was paid, the rent that was paid during that 12, 12 months. If it's a tenant's application and any of it was paid by universal credit or housing benefit, you discount that. Local housing authority might come along and make their own application, but the tenant can't get that back, which makes sense. And there's an interesting point just to be aware of, which is often missed, which is that um, Section 52 says that rent paid is treating, treated as including an amount which is not paid as rent, but which is offset against the rent. Now, you're looking at 12 months, a period of 12 months. Um, <clears throat> a case called Fakara and James, which went to the upper tribunal, which was a, another one actually where it was an allegation of unlawful eviction, which the tribunal found uh, proved, and that was challenged in the upper tribunal but upheld. In Fakara and James, the applicants said that the landlord had committed multiple offences, which the first tier tribunal, I think, agreed with. So they said, right, we want um, 12 months rent in respect of each offence. It's a maximum of 12 months, but we say it's a maximum of 12 months per offence. So if you've got three offences, you're looking at up to 36 months worth of rent. The upper tribunal said that was wrong. 12 months is the maximum, even with multiple offences. Uh, and that's partly because you cannot be required to repay more rent than was actually paid. And one other, well, two other cases to flag up, but Kowalak and Hassanane, there is the more important one really because it's a court of appeal decision, where um, when you go back and look at that wording, the way that it's done um, here, having to relate to the rent paid during that 12 months and must not exceed the rent paid in respect of that period, that's uh, been understood by the upper tribunal and the court of appeal as meaning that when you are determining the amount, you are looking at rent that's been paid in that 12 months and relates to that 12 months. It's not necessarily going to be everything that was actually paid in that 12 month period. Some of it might have been in arrears and relate to earlier period. Some of it might have been being paid in advance. And that's what you've got to look out for quite carefully. Um, and that's what happened in the Colonel case, actually. So um, <clears throat> this, this bit here particularly is, is quite different from the position in Wales. Position in Wales is set out in a case under the Housing Act 2004, uh, a case called Parker and Waller, I think. Um, in England, <clears throat> the way that it's dealt with under the 2016 Act, a couple of cases have set this out. That when making a rent repayment order, the tribunal is not limited to the profit that the landlord has made from their unlawful activity. Um, the purpose of these is, is deterrence to drive rogue landlords out of the market. And you don't do that by just limiting it to the profit that they've made. But equally, it's not meant to be compensatory towards a tenant. It's not compensation for loss or damage that they've suffered. There are other ways of doing that. So that was what was said in Vadamalian and Stewart, which is different from the position of the Housing Act 2004. 
What that led to for a while was first-year tribunals um, getting rent repayment order cases, saying, well, it's not limited to the profit. Uh, the starting point, therefore, is all the rent that was paid in those 12 months, and absent something exceptional, that's what you stick with. The upper tribunal says, no, that's wrong. There's no presumption that the amount of the rent paid is to be the amount of the order. It's a maximum that it can be, but it doesn't mean that the amount of the order is automatically or almost semi-automatically that. It's a case called Williams and Palmer. I mean, a number of upper tribunal decisions since reversing first-year tribunals that were sort of in between Vadamalian and Williams, where they've gone about it in the wrong way. So there are certain things that must be taken into account. The legislation says this. Conduct of the landlord, conduct of the tenant, landlord's financial circumstances, whether there's been a conviction, and um, including rent arrears. And this is interesting, actually, because if there are rent arrears, then if those occur during the 12 month period you're concerned with, that's already limited the amount that there can be because there's less rent paid. But there can be an even further deduction to reflect the fact that the tenant themselves is in breach. And this is a challenging COLEC on the basis that it's sort of double counting. But the, the Court of Appeal has agreed with the upper tribunal that it can do that. And one important point to note that comes out of the Vadamalian case is that where utilities are consumed by the tenant, but the landlord pays for them, because you've got a sort of all encompassing rent um, and utilities and so on paid for by the landlord, well, then those can be deducted out of it as well. Uh, it's a separate point, uh, but there does need to be some careful consideration in those sorts of cases about what you do with all the various energy rebates that are coming from government and energy suppliers at the moment as well. That's a slightly more complicated thing to think about. Um, I'm just going to deal with this quite quickly. The section 46, where well, there's actually been a conviction, but if there's got a conviction, then the amount is the maximum amount unless there are exceptional circumstances. That was basically what first year tribunals seem to have been applying across the board after Vadamali and that was wrong. Where you've got a conviction, the tenant really just goes to the tribunal, says, here's the conviction, that proves the offence, thank you very much. And it's now for the landlord to show that there are exceptional circumstances, meaning it would be unreasonable for them to pay the maximum, which is quite a difficult threshold. Local authority applications, I'm not going to say that much about, just as a different procedure, um, because they have to serve notice first and allow time for representations. And um, they can, as you might imagine, can only apply if it's housing in their area, and there's guidance that they have to consider, which is quite useful actually, and a duty on them to consider applying if aware that there has been a conviction. And there, you're concerned with the universal credit or housing benefit that's been paid rather than the um, just the, the headline amount of rent. So <clears throat> let's get on to them. That's the background. Let's get on to Rackson. Um, who is the correct landlord for a rent repayment order? Now, under the Housing Act 2004, the position in England was, and in Wales remained, that it could only be the immediate landlord because under that act, the order would take effect against someone called the appropriate person. And the way that appropriate person was defined meant that it was the person that got the rent from the tenant. So it, it could only be the immediate landlord. However, that definition wasn't carried over. The Housing and Planning Act 2016 was done differently. So that led to the argument, can you make a rent repayment order against any landlord in a chain? Where you've got, as I say, the situation X grants to Y and Y grants to Z, or it could be even more complicated than that. You could have several uh, linked higher up or a more horizontal chain. Who, who can you make it against? This is what the Supreme Court had to consider in Rackerson and Jepson. The basic facts are in um, 2006, a long lease of a flat, flat nine Mandeville Court in, in um, London was granted to Mr. Rackerson. And um, for a period of time, he lived in this property. Later on, he actually assigned the lease to himself and to uh, Miss Field, who was his partner. And so they, they lived there for a while, um, moved out and decided to let the flat. So they looked into letting it and they obviously got these letting agents, Hamptons. Hamptons introduced them to a company called Kensington Property Investment Group Limited, KPIG, <coughs> company that's still going today. May 2016, uh, Mr. Rackson granted a tenancy to that company um, for 36 months, less a day, so just about three years, 
at a rent of £2,643.33 a month. And it was a fairly standard uh, form of tenancy agreement, subject to a couple of adjustments, um, one of which uh, allowed KPIG to sublet uh, the various parts of, of, the, of the flat um, as part of the day-to-day -day management of their business. So what then happened throughout 2016 is that they granted licenses to various people. And I should say the fact that they're licenses rather than tenancies doesn't matter so far as the Housing Planning Act 2016 and rent repayment orders are made defined in a way that a tenancy can include a license. So you can't get around it just by proportions to licenses rather than tenancies. So they um, granted them to uh, Jepson, Murphy and MacArthur, who all, all in due course make this application for a rent repayment order. Now their total rent was about 2,297 a month. You remember that KPIG were paying more than that, 2,643 a month. Um, there was some evidence that actually there was another license granted to someone else at some point, but they don't appear to have played any part in the application. So KPIG weren't making it at a loss. Um, the, the property was an HMO, it was required to be licensed, it wasn't licensed. That's no dispute about that. What, what seems to have happened after a couple of years is that the letting agent told Mr Rackerson that KPIG wanted to apply for an HMO licence. Mr Rackerson, um, therefore, that's what he was told. No licence was ever granted and there was an evidence that actually demonstrated an application was ever made but but in any event no license granted uh, tenancy with kpig came to an end after three years less a day in may 2019 mr rackerson didn't renew it and then in september of that year jepson murphy and macarthur applied to the tribunal for a rent repayment order uh, in the sum of £26,140, pretty substantial, against Mr Rackerson and Miss Field on the basis that they had been uh, persons in control or managing an unlicensed HMO. Mr Rackerson and Miss Field respond, and as part of their response, they asked the tribunal to strike out the application basis there's no reasonable prospect of it succeeding because a rent repayment order could only be made against the immediate landlord and Miss Field also um, said she'd never been party to any agreement in respect of the property flat nine with either KPIG or any of Mr Jepson, Mr Murphy or Mr MacArthur and I should say as well uh, that because of the way this develops there's no finding ever that Mr. Rackerson actually had committed the offence of being in control or managing another licensed HMO. He um, he denied that he'd committed offence. He said he wasn't a person having control or managing it. Um, or, and then as an alternative to that, he said, even if that's wrong, had a reasonable excuse and a reasonable excuse is a defence. Because of the way that this came out, um, that's never decided. So there's, there's no finding that he actually committed any offence. But this was a he applied to strike on the basis, even if he had, <coughs> this could never succeed. The first year tribunal um, struck it out against Miss Field because she hadn't been a party to the agreement with KPIG, she hadn't been a party to the agreement with uh, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Jefferson, Mr. MacArthur. So, uh, on no basis could she be said to be the landlord. As against Mr. Rackerson, though, the first year tribunal didn't strike it out because there was an earlier upper tribunal case that said that it could be made against a head landlord even where there was an intermediate landlord, a case called Goldsborough and CA Property Management Limited. The first tier tribunal um, thought that it was bound by that decision, which it probably was, so it couldn't strike it out against him. So he then applied to uh, appeal to the upper tribunal against that. And that appeal was heard by the deputy president, Martin Roger QC, in 2020, um, and he dismissed the appeal. Now, interestingly, what the deputy president said was that as a matter of first impression, the language of section 40 suggested the need for a direct relationship of landlord and tenant. 
so that rent repayment orders in favour of tenants couldn't be made against a superior landlord, so couldn't be made against Mr Rackerson. But he uh, said in his decision that those first impressions were unreliable when you look at various other things. And in particular, he thought that it was quite important that a superior landlord could commit uh, at least one of the offences, and probably more, in relation to which rent repayment orders could be made. And so a superior landlord can commit the control and management offence, that was the, the whole point of this application, whether Mr Ackerson actually had was a separate point. Uh, and some of the uh, other offences in relation to unlawful eviction could be committed by a superior landlord. And um, he also thought that if rent repayment orders could only be made against the immediate landlord, then the grant of a short-term tenancy to an insubstantial intermediary who then sublet uh, could provide a route for avoidance of rent repayment orders. Mr Rackerson then appeals to the Court of Appeal. That appeal was heard and allowed by Lord Justice Baker, Lord Justice Arnold and Lady Justice Andrews in 2021. And um, they, they thought that actually the Deputy President had been right in his first impression. His first impression was right. And there was nothing to point away from that. The factors weren't sufficient. The first impression was the right one and should have stuck with it. So the applicants, the original applicants, then appealed to the Supreme Court and um, the Supreme Court's grants permission for some interveners. Safer Renting had intervened in the Court of Appeal and they applied to intervene in the Supreme Court. And the National Residential Landlords Association applied to intervene. That's where <coughs> I and uh, Rosie got involved. Um, the, the National Residential Landlords Association wanted to intervene because uh, some of the arguments that Safer Renting had made in the Court of Appeal were that the policies leading up to the Housing and Planning Act 2016 meant that you should read it in a way that landlords should be given an expansive definition. And the National Residential Landlords Association wanted us to uh, look at that and see if there was a counter argument. And we did. We looked at it and thought that there was a, a, a pretty good argument to be made that actually the policy background didn't back that up. So that was heard by the Supreme Court earlier this year, and they gave their decision last week. And the judgment is given by Lord Briggs and Lord Burroughs, joint judgment, and then the other uh, Supreme Court justices, Lord Jones, Kitchen and Lord Richards, all agree with it. And their starting point, um, <laughs> which in a way it said could almost be the end point, is that it's a straightforward interpretation of the legislation. Um, rent repayment orders can only be made against the immediate landlord of the tenancy that generates the relevant rent. Because if you look at section 40, subsection 2, they said um, there are two different types of rent repayment order. Uh, one which they called a rent RRO, because what you're looking at is the rent that's been paid by the tenants. And the other one they called a universal credit RRO, so on an application made by a local housing authority. And you're looking at a rent RRO, it's an order requiring the landlord under a tenancy of housing in England to repay an amount of rent paid by a tenant. So when you look at the amount of rent paid by a tenant, the Supreme Court said that plainly must refer back to the rent paid under the tenancy of housing. In which case, what you're concerned with is a landlord under that tenancy, which is going to be the tenant's immediate landlord. And that's a straightforward interpretation. Um, and so you could apply similar to a universal credit RRO, the wording slightly different. You're concerned with the amount of universal credit paid in respect of rent under the tenancy, but that must mean rent paid under the tenancy of housing in England. That's the, the tenancy that the tenants uh, occupy under, so the landlord means the landlord in relation to that tenancy, not the head landlord. That sort of simple, straightforward reading uh, the Supreme Court says it's the answer. Actually, I think this is quite quite important because there's been a lot that this was this case was covered in the BBC news in, in the run up and since, and there's been a lot said since about how this um, the Supreme Court has interpreted it in a certain way that creates problems with rent repayment orders and so on. I think some of that's unfair. This is a pretty standard, straightforward reading of the language that Parliament has chosen to use, but. The Supreme Court went on to say, well, are there any other any other reasons to go in a different direction? Um, so first of all, we go back to Housing Act 2004, which was the pre-existing position. 
could only be made against immediate landlords, the appropriate persons. So they looked at all the pre-legislative material, various consultation papers and things like that. And that's a lot of stuff that on behalf of the National Residential Landlords Association, we, we put before the Supreme Court to invite them to consider. And what was apparent there was that the government had consulted on and, and proposed changing the procedure, uh, the mechanism for applying for rent repayment orders and expanding the number of trigger offences. But there was nothing there that suggested that also adding to the class of landlords to take it above and beyond the category of in immediate landlords. There's nothing there to support that. Um, what the Supreme Court also go on to say, uh, there are various other things to look at. So um, some of these trigger offences can be committed by superior landlords, as the upper tribunal had said, but some of them could also be committed by people who are not landlord at all. Uh, indeed, letting agents can commit some of these offences but you can't get a rent repayment order against them. Um, so the intention that the Supreme Court discerns from that background was to restrict rent repayment orders to those who would directly benefit, benefiting from the payments of rent. That's the immediate landlords. That's what the intention was. And it's quite important to remember that a rent repayment order was only one sanction available to those seeking to attack road landlords. There were numerous other sanctions in play. Um, there are um, criminal offences that might be committed, so fines can be levied in relation to that. There are civil penalties that can be imposed by local housing authorities, a financial penalty of up to £30,000 for each offence, so more uh, than uh, the rent that was thought to be recovered here. I should say as well, can be levied in relation to other offences for which you can't get a rent repayment order. So you can actually get fairly hefty civil penalty uh, fines, effectively as they are, civil penalties being imposed by local housing authorities. Um, and you've also got the possibility of banning orders. And indeed the Supreme Court said um, that if, if a rogue landlord was to set up a straw company as a shield against liability, to a rent repayment order, which was a suggestion that was made by, uh, say, for renting as intervener, that that's something that landlords would do. Well, then there's a real danger there that the directors of the company are wrongfully trading contrary to the Insolvency Act and at risk of liability for that. And um, the, the submission that we made on behalf of the National Residential Landlords Association, which the Supreme Court quoted, um, was that it might be thought that the prospect of a property owner entering into such an arrangement solely to evade a potential rent repayment order while simultaneously leaving themselves open to prosecution for criminal offences is a little far-fetched. Now, I know that safer renting don't agree with us on that, but I, I do think you have to look at the likelihood of, of doing that purely to evade RROs, but leaving all these other sanctions in play just seems... Um, Unlikely, not saying it's never going to happen, but I don't think it's going to have tremendous efficacy if it's done. A couple of other factors that the Supreme Court thought were important um, practical complexity. Imagine you've got the situation where the um, rent payable uh, by um, the occupiers to their immediate landlord was more than the rent payable by the immediate landlord to the head landlord, which appears to be the situation in Rackerson. What, what rent are you concerned with? What, is there a cap? Who has to, how do you work that out? Is it, does it mean that actually the head landlord might be liable to repay more rent than they ever received? Well, that, that seems um, a little difficult and, and very difficult to work out as well. And they went through a whole load of other practical situations that might arise and just said that all of that complexity can be contrasted with the simplicity of a rent repayment order, which can only be made against the immediate landlord, which generated the relevant rent. And they also looked at how if you read um, section 40, which tells you what a rent repayment order is, or section 44, which tells you the amount, if you run those two together, you get what you see on the screen here, a rent repayment order is an order requiring the landlord under a tenancy of housing to repay an amount of rent paid by a tenant, the amount of which must not exceed the rent paid in respect of that period, less any relevant award of universal credit, etc. 
He said, well, that you, you read that, that's clearly getting at it being the rent under the tenancy that you're concerned with, the tenant's tenancy, and therefore what you're talking about is the immediate landlord. And um, I mean, it's always slightly difficult to interpret legislation from the bit that's missing, the bit that's not there. But what they said was, um, when you look at other legislation, other relevant legislation, including Protection from Eviction Act 1977, where Parliament wanted superior landlords to be caught, Parliament had expressly said so. And um, the word landlord, for the purposes of um, Section 1, Subsection 3A of the 77 Act, had been defined to include any superior landlord. Could have done the same in relation to rent repayment orders, hadn't done so. And that could be regarded as carrying with it the inference that the extended meaning of landlord was not applicable. And then they looked at all the pre legislative materials, I say, and said that was consistent with the straightforward, immediate landlord only interpretation. All the consultation papers and so on were about changing the, the, the process slightly um, and expanding the number of trigger offences, but not saying it. it um, it goes against superior landlords and had a purpose of the housing and planning bill, as it was when it was introduced, being to change the established feature of a rent repayment order so as to enable them to be made against a superior as well as an immediate landlord, then you would have expected to have seen that in the uh, consultation papers or the explanatory notes. And then the very final point that they thought was, if there was any doubt about that, there's a long-standing uh, principle or presumption against doubtful penalisation. Um, it's a principle of legal policy that a person should not be penalised except under clear law. Is that if, if there was any doubt, then you exercise it in favour of the head landlord in this case. So, <clears throat> cannot get rent repayment orders against head landlords, immediate landlords only. What does that mean? Is this a, a licence to create work around immediate tenancies? No, no, it is not. It absolutely is not. Um, there are the other criminal sanctions, there are the other civil sanctions, those are still available and I suspect actually local housing authorities will be being pressed to enforce those in cases where there is any suggestion that this has been entered into. Furthermore, um, there's a risk in some of those that the head tenancy will be treated as a sham, not a genuine arrangement. And there is already one upper tribunal case where that has happened. Um, the property owner uh, purported to grant a tenancy to a company that she was involved with and the tr tribunal um, viewed this as a sham, thought that she was getting the rent directly and a rent repayment order could be made against her and I think there's going to be um, tribunals really be alert and on the lookout for those sorts of things. And as the Supreme Court said in Rackerson, there's the possibility of liability for wrongful trading as well. So th th this is not um, Car blanche to just sort of set up these dodgy relationships to avoid rent repayment orders. Uh, and uh, if it was, it strikes me as a be pretty pointless because of the other sanctions. One interesting point that the Supreme Court did not decide was the argument that was made by the landlord in that, in Rackerson, which was um, not only did you have to have a direct relationship between tenant and landlord, which the Supreme Court agrees with. But that when you're making a rent repayment order, you're only concerned with the, the bottom tenancy, the occupational tenancy. So um, while uh, Mr. Jepson and so on could, in theory, obtain a rent repayment order against KPIG, KPIG couldn't go and get their own rent repayment order against Mr. Rackson. Supreme Court said it's a very interesting point, but they're going to leave it undecided. And that, that might be one for a future case. What does this also mean for renters' reform bill? Well, the um, Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government were uh, approached to see if they would uh, play any part in the Supreme Court uh, process. And they didn't want to, but said they would be watching it with some interest. And there is some indication that this will be looked at in the renters' reform bill when it comes. And I know there are those who are pressing for uh, Parliament to just simply reverse this decision. I don't think that's right, actually. I think as a, as a policy approach, I think there's a better way of dealing with it, which is this. Um, what The concern is the situation where rogue landlords are setting up 
the straw man operations where they've got intermediaries that simply can't be pursued, but they're trying to escape liability themselves. So I don't think it's going to happen all that much. Might be being naive, but there we go. But if that is the case, then you've got two, I would say, better ways to do it. You could allow in that situation an order, a rent repayment order to be made in addition to be made against the company, be made against the directors or the officers of that company, the ones who've taken the money out of it on a, on a joint and several basis. So you follow the money. The other one which could go with this, I think, is if you've got a situation where the property owner has purported to grant a tenancy, but it's not at arm's length and it's to a company or something they're associated with, well, then the tribunal might be uh, empowered to basically jump over that, treat it as not existing, and look to the actual head landlord. And those, I would suggest, are the ways if you really want to get to the, these rogue landlords, the ways of dealing with it. But um, simply reversing it and saying, well, it, fine, you can make it against head landlords. The interpretation that was contended for um, it by the other parties in the Supreme Court, it seems to me that's not going to stop the really, really bad rogues. Because even then, you don't want to present a how-to guide about how to do it. But there would be ways of setting up situations that could still protect the head landlord and they could evade liability. There might be other problems for them, but they could still evade rent repayment orders. Truly nefarious rogues could do that. I suggest that this proposal is the better way of doing that, which is in the interest of all good landlords, of course, to drive out the really bad rogues. So that's um, what to look for in the future, amongst many other things, no doubt, in the Renters' Reform Bill when it finally comes. I'm sure Tessa will talk to you uh, more about that when the Renters' Reform Bill, Renters Reform Bill is produced. But that's that's the effect of Rackus. And, um, you know, the Supreme Court recognised that there are genuine good reasons for entering into rent-to-rent -rent arrangements. Um, it's not just simply uh, uh, something that's relied on by rogues. And indeed, the intervener on the other side of safe renting acknowledged that there was a uh, valid part of the market. Right, Tessa, I think that's me uh, torn through that. I can see there's a few things uh, being raised, but I don't know, are there any questions we need to get into at the moment? Um, not really. Um, <clears throat> I've put a few notes up there. Um, if somebody is considering entering into a rent to rent arrangement, we do have some training on landlord law. We had a rent to rent training day a couple of years ago with David Smith and some of the solicitors from his firm. And uh, David Smith also created a special rent to rent tenancy agreement because one of the misunderstandings of rent to rent situations is people think that you can use ordinary assured shorthold tenancy agreements. And of course, you can't. Oh, not at all. <coughs> not at all. Nowhere near suitable. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I mean, part, partly because it's often granted to a company, and yeah. a company simply cannot have an assured shorthold tenancy. Can't have an assured tenancy. Just can't. Um, but, but also, even if it's granted to an individual, it's not going to work because they won't be occupying it as their only or principal home, which is an essential part of it being an assured and therefore a short shorthold tenancy. Now, you need something very different. You're absolutely right. And it is actually quite hard to get hold of special tenancy agreements. So when we did our rent to rent yeah. day a couple of years ago, I asked David if he could um, provide one. And I know it took him a very long time to create it, but um, you can buy that and uh, it can be yeah. adapted. And uh, you could also um, apply for um, uh, some advice with David if you needed to adapt it. So um, that is. Yeah, available. I, 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 I should, yeah, I, I should say. Um, Rosie and I were instructed by National Residential Landlords Association, but through JMW solicitors and David Smith. So David Smith, I'm sure, familiar to very many of you, but he was very heavily involved in this case as well. Yeah. Yeah. OK, um, we've had a question about um, um, do we know when the Renters Reform Bill is going to be published? And I, I think um, the answer to that is no. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that's right. I, I'm afraid <laughs> the question is other than the standard in this Parliament line. I, I cannot do better than that, I'm afraid. Um, save as to say that I did see something a couple of weeks ago that suggested later in the year rather than earlier. Yeah, I, 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 would, yeah. Um, I, I would be surprised if it was published soon because it's going to be a very complicated bill to, to, uh, to draft um so um i mean we we simply don't know 
Um, there's also another question yeah. about what type of tenancy agreement does a limited company provide to their tenants? Well, I mean, the, the company let is when the tenant is the company rather than the landlord. Yeah. Um, so yeah. if it's a, if the limited when, company when it, is the landlord, that's that doesn't change the type of tenancy that you provide. No, no. I, I think it's interesting if it's a company granting a tenancy to employees, but that's a different, uh, different yeah. pers- uh, issue altogether. But no, the, um, the the nature of the landlord doesn't matter too much. It's the nature of the tenant when you're concerned with Housing Act 1988. That's the key thing. Okay, right. Well, I think we're getting close to uh, getting close to the hour. So. Um... Thank you very much, Robert, for coming along and explaining it to us. It's been a fascinating talk. I've really enjoyed it. Um, the um, the talk is being recorded. We are going to be putting it online and it will go online on the uh, Landlord Law YouTube channel. I put a link to that in the chat and uh, I will probably also publish it on the Landlord Law blog. So if you want to watch it again, you you can do so. Great. Well, thank you, Tessa, for inviting me on and setting it all up. And uh, I hope that's useful, both by way of a primer on rent repayment orders, but also to try and dispel some of the wilder myths that might be circulating about the effect of this decision. May end up with egg on my face if everybody does set up these rogue companies to try and avoid it. But yeah, we'll see. Okay. well, I mean, the rogues are always with us. There are always going to be dishonest people who will try to evade the law. I mean, that's that's the case in, in all areas of life not just landlord and tenant. Um, you know, yeah. all you have to do is, is try and make it difficult for them. Yeah. Well, as we were discussing before we came on, on air, as it were, uh, enforcement, that's the key. Absolutely. OK, right. Well, I'm going to close down now, everybody. Thank you very much for attending. And particularly, thank you, Robert. And uh, hopefully we'll be thank doing you. some other webinars in due course. Thank you, everybody. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye bye.